been chatting here a little too much. It's been, uh, uh, we're five minutes past due, so my apologies. Uh, but I would call the meeting to order, and it looks like it's about uh, 4.50. And uh, second item on the agenda is approval of the agenda. Uh, you all have, I think, a copy of the agenda in front of you. Is there a motion to approve? I'll make a motion. Second. A motion and a second. Uh, any additions or modifications? Otherwise, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, motion carries. Uh, item number three on the agenda is approval of the minutes, uh, and that would be the minutes from our last meeting on July 7, 2015. Uh, we uh, think I'll have a copy of that. Uh, Alderman Galvin was not uh, a member of the committee at that time. Uh, but uh, we have the, the minutes in front of us. Are there any additions or corrections, or is there a motion to approve? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes as, as presented. And I'll second that motion. Uh, so we have a motion to second. Any further additions or corrections or comments? Otherwise, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Um, any opposed? Motion carries. On to item number four, the real purpose that we're here tonight is uh, the presentation uh, from Attorney Chavez uh, regarding the quasi-judicial hearings training presentation. Attorney Chavez, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, members of the committee, um, the purpose of tonight's um, training is we, we wanted to make sure that when, when you guys meet for the first time, um, since you guys have not had to actually conduct any closed judicial hearings before that you were aware of how the process worked and what it is that you're you're charged with when you're doing this process and so um, and, and since I'm new we felt it was also a good you know opportunity for you for me to make sure that you guys know everything that I I know when it comes to quasi judicial hearings so I'm sure the first question you have is what is a quasi judicial hearing <laughs> Well, the basic answer is that it is a hearing that satisfies the requirements of due process of law. So what that means is anytime you have a uh, deprivation of a person's life, liberty, or property, you have to give them certain, um, certain considerations. And what we deal with here is rarely in the life and liberty, it's usually in the property realm. And so we're focused primarily um, in, in this setting on any time we're depriving people of the property. The second time it comes into play is when you have a decision that affects a small number of people or an individual. So when you have a legislative action, uh, the protections that need to be afforded to, to the people effect, that are affected by it are much lower just because it's affecting everyone equally and so you're assuming that because everyone's going to be affected equally that there's no um, opportunity for you know, unfairness to, to come up in the same kind of ways. So instead when you're, when you're treating people or applying um, standards to people on an individualized basis, that's when that real opportunity to actually um, you know, put in, impose, I don't even know what the word would be, um, anytime you want to impose some kind of um, punishment on somebody or if you want to get even with them or something, that's the time it would happen. So to make sure that that's not happening, we have to have due process. The last time that it comes up is when you're making factual determinations about an individual and applying an ordinance to that. So, for example, we just we just discussed with the Planning Commission um, conditional use permits. And the reason that happens is because under the ordinance, if you have a conditional use, per, or if you're looking for a conditional use, you have to meet certain criteria to prove that it's not going to become a detriment. And so when you are looking at those standards, what you're really doing is saying, okay, does it meet this? Let's see if the property actually qualifies it, and the facts that we are determining actually apply here um, based on you know, what facts we just came up with. So you're seeing property, does it look like this, and will it be okay based on the ordinance? You're taking a set of facts and you're applying a set of standards from the ordinance and applying it to it. So when you are acting in quasi-judicial setting, what you are basically doing is acting as a mini, um, a mini court. You are taking on the role of a judge in the most basic sense. Now that doesn't mean you have to have a legal degree, it doesn't mean you have to be an attorney, it doesn't mean you have to be a judge. It means that you have to make factual determinations and you have to apply the law based on those determinations that you've made. 
and we go back to that same concept of what's caring, which is if it's affecting a small number of people, we have to give them those additional protections. So what are the elements of due process? Well, the most basic fundamental heart, it's notice and hearing. We also have this third component that just flows from that, which is you can't have a decision that's arbitrary or unreasonable, meaning that you have to give them a chance, you have to tell them that, they're gonna, that something's gonna be happening to them. Then you have to give them a chance to actually be heard, and then when you actually render your decision, you have to make sure that it's based on what actually happened there, and that you're applying it uh, the legal standards according to how they should be applied. So let's go over each one in turn. The first element is written notice to parties. Now this one doesn't really affect you so much because this will be handled by staff. But we have this is in addition to the open meetings notice. This is actually something sent to that person and individualized, um, letting them know that a hearing will be taking place, what the facts are that are being alleged against them. Um, Enough so that they can prepare, prepare defense. Has to list any instructions that are important for them to know. Like if you want to present evidence, we're only gonna uh, accept it at the hearing or you can present um, witnesses for up to 30 minutes. Any instructions that are important for the person to know in order to, to defend themselves need to be included in that notice. Um, the next is that it has to notify them that they have a right to prepare a defense and be represented by an attorney. The real meat and potatoes of what you guys will do is the opportunity to be heard. And there are two real components to that. The first is a meaningful time. The second is in a meaningful manner. Meaningful time means just soon enough for it to matter, which means that you can't just push something off um, by saying, oh, we'll hear it in six months. And this happens more when you have like a condition of use permit or um, probably liquor licenses, stuff where you know people need to have a decision made um, that's when you really see it, but having something just delayed inevitably or pushing it, you know, just further down the line or even just kind of extending it a few more months than it, than it really should be, if it's not soon enough to make any real impact, you're not giving them the, the hearing that they need. The second one is a meaningful matter, which means that they have a right to hear the evidence that's being presented against them. They, need, they have a right to refute that evidence and they have a right to present their case. <coughs> The last one is your decision. Um, what's important about that is after you've actually had your hearing, <coughs> you actually have to consider that dis your, your decision has to be made based on what came out of that hearing. So when they actually come and they present their witnesses and they present their exhibits and they tell you what their case is and both sides do that, um, they're creating what's called a record. And only what's considered during that hearing is part of the record. And what your decision has to be made on is solely that record. If you're taking stuff outside of that record, it's considered, that's where you get into that arbitrary um, decision making because what you heard is what you should actually be making your decision on. The idea behind that is when somebody comes and presents their case, they're arguing their case, they're presenting everything to you that they think you should know. And so if the parties aren't presenting it, it's because the parties either don't believe it's true or they don't know it exists or whatever, but either way, it's not something that actually was a part of their case. The one thing that gets people into trouble are ex parte communications. Um, what that means, and we'll go into this in more, more depth shortly, is you can't, have to, you can't have conversations outside of it. So if you're supposed to be listening to just or deciding based on what's on the record, that means you don't go do independent investigations into stuff, and you don't go talk to people outside of the hearing. And these are just basic basic concepts, but ex parte communications will get you into trouble, but we'll have an entire discussion on those by themselves. So um, You also have to explain in your decision why you made the decision you did, how you reached your decision. And the, 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 uh, the reason for that is if you have a reasoned, non-arbitrary decision, it should be based on the facts, and it should flow from those facts. And so when you're, when you're applying the law to the facts, your conclusion should just naturally flow from it. And then the last part is it can't be un arbitrary, unreasonable, meaning it needs to be fair and unbiased, and of course it has to be reasoned and based on the facts. So ex parte communications. 
This one is, like I said, this is what you'll get people um, every single time. So an ex parte communication is any discussion regarding the matter that's coming before you that's not a part of the record. So it's discussions with just one party, just one witness, members of the community, and when you have, in the instance of a person who's actually an elected official as well, it, it's harder to keep that in check because you will have people who come up to you and say, well, I, let me tell you my opinion on this, or, you know what, I have all this extra information. And it comes up a lot in land use where people are really um, up in arms about potential use of land. That's why I keep going back to that because it's nice, easy, <coughs> positive use that happens all the time with that. Um, but they get up in arms and they'll want to come and complain and say, look, here's the situation, here's what's been happening in my neighborhood, let me tell you, I know all this stuff. And it's hard for people to regulate that because they think that because you're an elected official, they should be able to just tell you that. But because we're dealing with an individual's rights, if you're acting in a quasi-judicial capacity, you really do have an obligation to step back and say, look, we're going to be considering this at a hearing. That's your opportunity to come and speak. Question? Yes, sir. So until a complaint is officially filed, we're not, if anyone comes up and discusses something with us in advance of that, that's not an issue technically until after the complaint is filed. Not technically. So we're going to get, the next thing we're going to talk about is, is uh, well, let's go over why they're bad. Okay. So ex parte communications are bad because it creates this idea that you're either improper, improperly influenced, you're inaccurately informed, you're provided with only one side of the issue, the other side feels cheated, even if it's not true and you acquire a reputation for being susceptible <coughs> to improper influence. But more importantly, if you have an ex parte communication, it can, in fact, invalidate the action that was taken. So, an ex parte communication, believe it or not, are pretty common. So, if you have one, all is not lost. Instead, what you have to consider is whether, if you prejudge the matter based on you know, the information you've gained, or if you're now biased. If you are, and you can no longer fairly and impartially participate in hearings, you have to recuse yourself. There's just no way to go around that. Um, the entire purpose of a due process hearing is to provide um, the person who's coming before you a fair and impartial hearing. If you're either, you've either prejudged or you're biased, you're incapable of doing that or recusal is necessary. If you're not, if you, haven't, you feel like you haven't prejudged it and you're not biased, then you can still participate. You just need to disclose the communications and make them a part of the record. So essentially at the beginning of the, of the hearing, what you'd say is, I received an email from so-and-so on this date. I just want to make it a part of the record. And you introduce it. Everybody has all the same information now. No harm, no foul. So this comes to the next one. You guys actually had way less uh, questions about ex parte communications in the last hearing, the last training I did. I, I, I'm gonna, I do have a question. Okay. You know, is that where, you know, like I've read the articles, um, I've read the complaint because it was all emailed to us. Do I have to just state that out in the, before the hearing that I've read the articles in the Press Gazette and I've also read the complaint, but I know that I can be um, unbiased about the. So complaints are different anytime, and we're going to talk in the general because we're not addressing any specific um, case tonight. We're talking about any hearing that you guys have. If you get a complaint, that's going to be part of the record. There's, there's no issue with that. It just by nature of being the complaint will be a part of the record. Um, any articles that you've read, so we don't expect you to live in a bubble. That's just not realistic. So I think if you if you state yes you've read this and then just declare no I have not prejudged this issue well, you know I'm not biased I've not made up my mind um, but I just want you to remember yes I have read these these articles it was impossible not to um, I think that that's that's what you need to do to ensure that that the other parties that are involved are able to uh, be aware of what it is that you're what you know. So. Question. So anything that is public, can we still report that? Or so you would want to know when you have 
red stuff that's so if it doesn't come directly from the city as part of the packet that you are provided um, in preparation for the hearing okay. you probably would want to disclose nice. just to know that. Um, okay. well, we, we wouldn't be disclosing I mean if you hear people make comments you don't have to disclose that it's if you actually you are given information that people feel pertains to that that incident correct it's any information, any communications you have. So it's discussions or it's statements okay. that are made to you. All right. Now, as far as there was something else I was going to mention about news news articles. So when you have a news article, oh, so independent investigations. What I tell people when it comes to land use is, don't go look at the site. Now, if you drive by it every single day, you can expect it to be expected to take an alternate course. And you can, you know, you don't have to avert your eyes every time you drive by it. So in this case, if you, if you see a headline, you can't help that. But I would not, once you know that the case is going to be coming in front of you, or you think the likelihood is pretty high, you might want to avoid reading the actual articles for a while. I think that's what I mean. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then just disclose, you know, what it is that you guys have you know, what articles you've read, if you know. Okay, so conflicts of interest is the next time that this obligation to recuse yourself comes up. A duty to disclose all conflicts exists for all of the boards and committees and uh, elected officials in the city. And so you've already done that. But if something comes up which has a direct monetary or other material benefit, you are obligated to recuse if it, any time uh, that interest has uh, a tendency to impair your independence of judgment. So that's a pretty low standard, meaning it doesn't have to necessarily impair it, it just has to tend to. So if, for example, if um, let's go back to the land use because those are nice and easy. If somebody has an ownership interest in something, or even the adjacent landowner, um, if, they, if they're the adjacent owner to something and you know it could affect their how much their property is worth, that's a direct benefit, and they probably would um, be more biased or have a, a, a change judgment just because their, their own uh, interest would be affected by it. Okay. The last one is uh, bias. Can I just go back to the conflict? Sure. Uh, what's the situation where, uh, I know you've got uh, financial interests and uh, other material benefits, but uh, what if you are acquainted with or know one of the parties or one of the witnesses, um, you know, beyond just the social gathering? So we're going to get to that one. Okay. As part of All right. Bias. I'll withdraw my question. Okay. <laughs> oh, that sounds official. Yeah. So recusal is also required when you are actually biased or if there's an impermissibly high risk of bias. So examples of bias are advocating on behalf of one party. So if you have go back to the land use because those are nice and easy it's a, it's a little more difficult in this situation but if you've got a land use and you say I know so and so great person this is a fantastic project that's advocating so you don't really have um, any any business being the person who's making that decision when you're also the person who's advocating for a project um, making questionable comments prior to the hearing um, that doesn't mean that you can't have any opinion but if you are making comments that basically indicate that you have either reached a decision or you are biased in some way, then there is in fact a problem and recusal will, bite, will, will probably be necessary. The last one is personal or professional history with the person or project, which is what you're going to. So, yes, in that case, bias is very high and so recusal may be necessary. Uh, now, back to that though, would it be appropriate to disclose that and say that I, I, this person is a witness, and I happen to be on a parish council with that person, so I, I know them in you know beyond just the social setting. I'm on a committee with them uh, somewhere else, but it doesn't, uh, in my opinion, it doesn't cause a bias for me. Uh, you know, I'm not giving that person any greater weight uh, for their testimony than somebody else. You would definitely want to disclose it. Yes. Um, the, the, the general advice I give to people is disclosure will never get you into trouble. 
disclosure is if you don't disclose, that's when you get into trouble. So if you even think that there's the opportunity that somebody will think there's bias, if you, the best thing you can do is disclose it because then any appearance of impropriety goes away. And uh, in my little analogy, I used the, the reference to, for example, a witness. So it's, it may not be one of the parties, so it's even even more removed from total disclosure? Yeah, I would say you would want to. And the reason being is when we get to, to the evidence section, what you guys consider, you go to credibility. And so you would want to make note on there that you know, you're not going to basically give one person's weight, uh, undue credit where it isn't warranted. So, um, you know, the elephant in the room. I'm on the council. Most of the complaints will be against council members. Going forward, then, I mean, I have a relationship with all of them, a working relationship to a certain extent. Um, is that, am I going to be like recused then all the time? Or no. Only if I say that I would be recused if I say I truly have a, an opinion one way or the other and I can't, uh, can't be totally unbiased. So, personal and professional history, that usually means. Mm, like they're your bestie, or they're a okay. close relative, or okay. um, somebody that you have a, a relationship with that you know okay. really influences your, your your position. At the same time, if it's somebody that you can't stand, that's that's also an issue too. You don't you want to have a, a group of judges who. Are not a, who don't even appear biased. You just want to make sure that it's a clean proceeding. At the same time, the reason it's made up of you all is because by ordinance you have to have somebody from the council because it's only fair to have one of your own deciding this. Same thing, employees are entitled to have another employee also participating in that. So, just by nature of the fact, you know, just by the fact that you guys are who you are, isn't going to mean that you're going to have to be recused. It just that's just. You're chosen based on your your knowledge and experience. So recusal. Before we leave these, recusal means no participation. If you recuse yourself, um, you are not able to sit up at the um, bench anymore. Um, you, it doesn't mean you can't, you know, sit in the room if it's an open meeting. You are still able to be involved. You're still able to to um, offer testimony and whatnot. But as far as being a member of the body that actually decides, you can't participate in, del in the deliberations, you can't participate in the decision, you can't sit up at the, at the head table. You want to make it clear to the people who are presenting that you're not a part of the proceedings. And then going back to um, making questionable comments, so the other thing to keep in mind is that you can have bias towards either a person or an issue. And so if you have been advocating, or if you, know, if you have a person that you either love or can't stand, that can come up. But at the same time, if there's a, this happens more in, in land use. But if you have a person or a project that comes up that you can't, that you think it's a terrible idea, or just you think that anytime you do a certain land use, it's just a bad idea, or a great idea at the same time, that's a bias that people will have to overcome. So those themselves, so you can either have a bias against a person or against an issue. Okay, so having an opinion does not mean you are biased. When you, if you are making comments, it doesn't mean that you can't say, well, I would avoid saying anything, that's just the cleanest thing you can do. But if you've already said stuff in the past, um, you can't unring the bell. So instead, what you are looking at is, do those comments rise to the level where you, somebody would question whether or not you have bias? And so merely having an opinion doesn't mean you're biased. But if your comments are of a questionable nature, you really have to look at those and decide whether or not it's something you should be participating in. If you are able to accord the same impartial considerations to every person who appears before you, you're not biased. What you're really trying to do, what we're trying to avoid with bias, is we want to make sure that everybody gets a fair and impartial hearing. That's really the crux of a due process hearing. That's the whole, that's the whole point. So at the hearing, there are a couple of requirements. The first is everybody, or the, peop the 
the person appear appearing before you has to have an opportunity pr to present their claim or defense. Um, witnesses, this is not always a, a requirement, but I highly recommend that if you're going to accept testimony from witnesses, you have it done under oath. The reason being, if we, once we get to credibility, if you've had your witnesses sworn under penalty of perjury, the likelihood that their um, testimony is going to be accepted if it goes up on appeal is much higher. So your decision that is saying that you based it on the fact that these witnesses were credible, that it gives a lot more credence to your, to your decision. Um, both sides of the controversy have to be, uh, you can't just look at one side and decide it based on that. You have to listen to both sides. That's really what it comes down to. And then the last one is the chair presides, just like in every other meeting, but you can appeal a decision and overturn it by vote. I have a question on the uh, the second one about the being sworn. For the hearings here, would there be like a court reporter uh, transcribing the yeah. hearing? Okay, so it would just be taped and that would be it? Okay. Yes. Yes. And at the hearing, you can establish time limits. Um, Time limits can apply to every single hearing, meaning we're going to let every, every um, hearing that comes before us, both parties get 30 minutes each. Or um, each witness is allowed to speak two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, whatever you want to limit. Um, or you can assign um, limitations based on the complexity of the matter that's coming before you. So if you've got something that's really simple coming before you, you can decide that it's going to go by your general one. And if something more complex comes in and you know they're going to need two or three hours to really get everything in that they need to, you can extend those time limits. You just want to be as fair as possible. And the most important thing is that however much time you allow one side, you have to give the same opportunity to the opposite side. Can we ask them in advance how long you think it might take them to present? You can. I mean, just give us an idea of what we're talking about. Sure. And this happens usually, like when it becomes really important is when you have a public hearing attached to it. You all won't really have a public hearing, um, uh, like an opportunity for the public to come and state their opinion in opposition or in favor of something. You can see it all the time in land use where they are actually you know, considering whether or not it's good for the public. Um, but in those instances, you want to make sure that, uh, I mean, you can stay there all night listening to, to people uh, either stating their position for or against a project, and so time limits really become necessary in those, in those scenarios. And then this, the chair is the one who would swear on all the parties and staff at this point. So the order of presentation, this is assuming a very um, sophisticated, kind of an all-out hearing. Um, some of them will not require this much due process, others um, will be almost trial-like in nature. And when you have those trial-like in nature ones, this is really what you would want to do. You'd have staff presentation, which may or may not apply in this case, um, because I'm not sure that you would have staff really recommending anything to you other than just saying, here's your, here's your uh, complaint, have fun. <laughs> um, then you'd have the appellant's presentation, the opposition's presentation, the person who has an opportunity or who has the burden of proof always goes first, and then they're given an opportunity to go last. You would do a summation or the rebuttal at that point, and then you can do questions. The parties have an opportunity to question amongst them, amongst, uh, between each other. And so when you do that, there's two ways to do that. Either the chair can be the one who asks all the questions, meaning that they provide their questions to the chair, the chair asks them, and then they they um, are answered by the, the proper party, or the chair can allow the parties to ask questions of each other. It's usually an issue when you have a contentious matter or things that have a tendency to get out of control that you want to just um, keep things as civil as possible, you'll, you'll run things through the chair. So this wouldn't be the same as sort of a court proceeding where you, there's cross-examination of each witness as they come forward? No. No, because if you're going to give them, especially if you're going to give them time limits, you don't want to, to take all of their time with cross-examining witnesses. You know what I mean? So, and then what you what instead the, the the better way to do it is to let them present their case entirely, and then they can ask each other questions. 
What about us asking them questions where we don't have the right to do that? You guys can ask as many questions as you want. You guys are the fact finders, and so you're entitled to ask those. So usually what we end up doing is after staff closes, or in this case, I think actually what would just end up happening is they would ask questions, and then when you guys get to the point of discussion and asking your questions, you ask whatever's remaining. Um, I always recommend that um, you avoid having any discussions about the issue until you get to the deliberations because you don't want to look like you're prejudging the issue based on just part of the evidence that's already been presented. You want to wait till everything's in. So if you, if you let them get their questions in, then the less questions you have to ask, the, the, the better it usually is for you. So the appellant states their case, produces their witnesses, they, they, they're done, the opponent gets up, states their case, their witnesses, everything, they get done. Summation, rebuttal, and then either they, we allow them to ask each other questions or they present the questions to us and then the chair would ask their questions. And then after that we can ask questions if we want to reaffirm or yeah, further usually define something. What you'll want to do is if there's still questions that you have after that, after they've had all the opportunity to present everything and they're fully done, and there's still things that you just haven't had answered, <coughs> at that point you want to ask. Okay. You want to wait until they're they're done presenting. Okay. That's why you guys go last. All right. Makes sense. A couple of questions. Um, I, I probably could look at something I can't remember off the top of my head. <coughs> and does any of the parties, do any of the parties have the right to close the hearing? Yes. Okay. So it can be closed to the public. It can be closed to the public, yes. And what about the, let's say the hearing, the testimony part is open, what happens with the deliberative process? Does that stay open or is that closed? Deliberations can be closed under certain circumstances. What we would want to do is before any specific instance is brought up before you, we want to make sure or, or see if there's anything under the statute which would allow, allow deliberations to be done in closed session. But usually, um, the rule of thumb is if it looks more like a trial where you've got two opponents coming and um, presenting it, that's when you're going to be able to post it. Okay. And in terms of the discussion, uh, that's that's a discussion amongst all of us uh, here in, on the on the board level. When it comes to a decision, uh, you know, is it you know three to two or or do we have to come up to a unanimous decision or what's the What's the, how do you get to the end result? So action is just like any other um, committee meeting, meaning unless you're given other direction at the time of your hearing, it'll be just a majority vote. And it's, it's done by a motion in a second, and then you have to actually have a roll call vote. So at, at the end of everything's been presented, we've asked all our questions. We have the opportunity to deliberate amongst ourselves, or that's open to the public too. So if I sit here and I go, well, what do you think about this thing, or I think I saw this or that, that's all open to the public. So that'll depend. If it's, um, if we will, what we will be doing is before any, so I act as, as counsel to the, to, the, to the board to make sure that you guys have um, these questions answered, but we have to do it on a case-by-case -case basis because there's no rule um, that applies across the board. And so instead what we'll do is when we get any complaint that's going to come before you, before that hearing, we'll, we'll find out under what circumstances it can be closed okay. and what part of the, whether it's deliberations or um, just the actual, well, the, if the um, proceedings are closed, generally the deliberations are closed as well. Okay. So it'll just, we will have that information for you. It's just we can't give you that cut and dry your sure. you know, line because yeah. it'll change. If one of the two parties requests it to be closed, is it automatically granted or is there a process? And one of the other sites says, no, I want this open to the public. The party that is the subject of the complaint mm -hmm. has the right to close it. And there's, uh, they request that, that's it, it's closed. Yep. Everything. Yes. And who's it closed to? Is it, um, it's close to the public. Is it just then, um, the appellant and the opponent and their attorneys, that's all that can be present in yes. yourself? Do they request for witnesses? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. No. Good question. No, it's a good question. It's a good question. Okay. Um, another hearing-related issue, what if there are objections 
to something. Somebody, try, is that your next slide? Next page. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> it's All right, like I'll, I'll withdraw <laughs> again. I'll wait till you, I, I won't jump ahead. Okay. So rules of evidence don't apply. But what we are doing is looking for evidence that is credible, relevant, and probative, meaning that it tends to prove or disprove one of the allegations. And you can accept uh, witness testimony, exhibits, um, in this case, you're not going to have any site visits. That's, that's going to be extremely rare unless you have something where it's an allegation that something happened at a specific spot. Um, but you can accept witnesses, witness testimony and exhibits. Um, when we talk about evidence being credible, it just means that it's believable. And so you, you give weight to testimony based on how believable you think it is. And when you're taking evidence, you want it to be relevant to what you're actually looking at. So in the instance of a specific charge, you will look at what is um, being alleged, what the ordinance states you're actually considering, and then whether or not it's relevant to those provisions that you're trying to either determine whether they're true or false. Um, and then if it doesn't prove or disprove something, it, there's no point to, to hearing it. Same thing if it's, irre if it's irrelevant to what you're considering, there's no, there's no point to it. Does okay. the chair stop that if someone starts bringing in material that uh, you know, we believe is irrelevant or has nothing to do with the subject matter? You can, yes. Yes. So there's Just two ways to, to deal with it. It's <laughs> getting too far. Yeah, okay. There's well, two ways to deal with it. The, the most effective way is to stop it when it's coming in and say, I'm sorry, that's beyond what we're looking at. We're not considering Here's and then so for example, I had Joe put to uh, take a look at the ordinance, and um, do you want to sure talk about? Exactly. We were we were looking at if if there's an issue with gifts and favors being provided, like what would the what the actual <coughs> components you be or the elements you'd be looking at of the violation? So Joe. Yeah, so if you look at the ordinance, it talks about gifts and favors and receiving those, and it says um, discretion and judgment of a reasonable, prudent person shall be exercised in the acceptance of gifts, and then gifts which may tend to influence your decisions or official duties. So if you look at that, there would be um, it's the discretion of a reasonable, prudent person, so you'd want to use an objective standard for that. And then obviously accepting a gift, you would need to accept the gift. So if evidence came in saying, I thought about accepting a gift, well, they didn't actually do it. You, need, you actually need to accept a gift. Um, and then it had to be a gift that would tend to influence uh, an official or employee and influence their decisions that they make. So I guess an example of that would be for a public official, if a citizen offers an older person a car in exchange to approving a liquor license, then obviously that would be a gift that would tend to you know, influence your decisions. So some credible evidence or relevant evidence would be, you know, the car, the testimony from the older person, testimony from the person who, the citizen. Um, things that would be, that probably would be irrelevant would be um, the older person, their, their criminal record, or um, they play basketball together, or their kids are on the same Little League team. You know, that stuff might not be relevant to the actual gift that they receive. So you just want to focus on what's relevant to the gift you receive and does it tend to influence your decisions. That'd be an example. And as far as when you're actually dealing with it, you can stop it when it's happening, or you can decide to let it in and then just exclude it as part of your deliberations. But the clean thing to do is stop it when it's coming in. Because if it's in the record, then the assumption is that you considered it nonetheless. With respect to exhibits, um, what if the, their proposed exhibit is a letter from somebody? So it's essentially testimony by by virtue of a letter, and they present it as an exhibit. Uh, is that something that we can accept, or does that, that person who wrote the letter actually have to be here to testify? So you're talking about hearsay, which we get into oh, later. Okay. But <laughs> oh, I'll just stress it now. Still jumping the question. That's okay. That's, 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 that's because you're an attorney and you know what questions to ask. So if you get hearsay, which is an out-of-court out statement made for uh, the truth of the statement, Mm -hmm. completely terrible way to, to explain what hearsay is, but that's the actual definition. And if you get it, it's basically just if you get any testimony in which people are offering to prove that something's true, um, whether it's, it's written, whether it's oral, 
somebody says, so and so told me, that's hearsay. Or if you get a letter or you get a police report or something, anything that's written down because it was not made during the hearing is considered hearsay. However, hearsay is, is allowable in proceedings of this nature. But my recommendation would be is that if you're going to accept hearsay evidence, that you would also want to corroborate it. Meaning that if somebody says, so and so told me that they can't, that they did this because um, they accepted a gift because they have 50 grand in medical bills and they just can't afford it otherwise. Well, you could accept that, but you would also ask for, or, or you know, look for maybe those medical bills or something to, to prove that they, you know, that statement probably was made to them. But like a police report would not be hearsay, that would be. It is hearsay, unless you have the officer here testifying, it's, it's considered hearsay. Now, you guys can accept it. Um, it's not something that's prohibited. The rules of evidence do not apply. So even though we couldn't introduce it in court without the officer present, you can introduce it here and consider it here because it's hearsay and you would just go to the credibility of whether or not you think it's true. Does the appellant or the opponent have the right to attack the credibility of witnesses? Yeah. I mean, they can bring up instances where the witness was uh, untruthful in previous incidents or things like that or... That's rare. I mean, that's rare because the rules of evidence, they're, they're not enforced. But right. if they want to, to tell you, you know, this person's just not very credible, look, they, we know they lie all the time, you can consider that. Okay. The rules are very lax. You, you're coming at it from a very, um, from a, a, a standpoint where rules are actually enforced and they don't apply here in the same force. Too much training. Yes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, so witness testimony. As we stated earlier, sworn to our testimony is not always required, but it's just good practice even when it's not. If you are appealed, you want your evidence and your decisions to be upheld, and you want to say that the evidence you took was credible. The simple, easy um, way to swear people in, just at the beginning of the, of the, of the uh, proceedings, have everybody who's planning on testifying stand up. They can do it all at the same time. Have them raise the right hand and say, you know, do you solemnly swear a testimony or you shall give in this matter should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And if you're going to have them, if they want to come up and give testimony more than once, all you have to do is just have them affirm that they do, in fact, know that they're still under oath. And that's as simple as saying, um, thank you for coming back. You're aware that you're still under oath. They say yes, you're good to go. And just good practices to keep a, li a, a witness list as part of the record. Um, these are recorded, but a lot of times it's difficult to hear what's going on. And so you just want to make sure that if something goes up on appeal, your record's complete and your, your uh, witnesses are identified. Exhibits include anything else, pretty much. Um, it's photos, it's papers, it's charts, it's charts, it's anything tangible. Somebody wants to bring in, well, it wouldn't happen here, but if somebody wants to bring in a gun, that's an exhibit. Um, and so it's anything. Um, they have to be admitted into the record, and you have to keep a copy as part of the record. But you can do it all at once. What we used to do is we would allow all of the um, exhibits to be introduced at the same time. You just know uh, who is introducing it. So it would be Appellant's Exhibit A, Opponent's Exhibit B, Staff's Exhibit C, and they. Uh, and then. Um, what you would basically do is, as long as there's no, no objection, you can accept it all into evidence. And then when they need it during the proceeding, they just grab it and refer to it by its exhibit number. Well, um, and now we're going to get to the objections. Well, before that, with your exhibits, you know, for, for those of us who practice in court, uh, we present the exhibit to the clerk. The clerk puts a sticker on it that says plaintiffs and defendants exhibit A or B or exhibit 1. Is somebody going to be doing that at our hearings, or do we have to do that? Whatever you guys need. If you want, um, yeah, I don't actually, know. generally, I think it's you because you're the one who's accepting it. Okay. I think that you will actually be the one no noting it as A or B. But you can designate somebody else. Yeah. I'm sure that that somebody else in the room, including myself, might be willing to help you just keep track of your exhibits. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and then the last thing is just to keep an exhibit with list, same as your, your witnesses. And, and then we c that is all those exhibits are kept by this body or something? Yes. Forever? That's it? Um, I don't know about forever, but we keep them for a long time. <laughs> 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 
objections. So if you receive any objections, you want to make sure you repeat it and just get it onto the record so it's it's clear what it is that's being objected. Find out if they're going to, if it's opposed. If it is, have them give their reasons. If you are not ready to rule on the objection, it's just kind of weird and out there and you don't really know what to do with it, you can always confer with legal counsel. Um, or you can just hold off on, on ruling on it until you've got enough information, meaning you've had a chance. I mean, we'll, my obligation is to be present at the hearings, so I think we'll be able to, to get those addressed pretty quickly. In the off chance legal counsel was not present, you would still be able to um, hold off on ruling on it until you're able to get legal counsel so you can stop and go call counsel during uh, your deliberations. And as long as you make your ruling on your objections before you make your decision, that's all that's required. And you'll be there anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay. So procedurally, we would somebody objects, we'd stop the process, and so the testimony would stop at that point when we receive an objection, and then we ask those questions, and then consult with you, and then make a decision whether we're going to accept uh, the testimony or the exhibit or whatever is being objected to or not. Yes. Okay. And, and usually well, the way I see it, um, although most of the boards that I've seen have not been chaired by an attorney, they just note the objections and then they rule on them later. And usually they just let pretty much anything in because the rules of evidence don't apply. Right. Yeah. So it's, there's usually got a pretty good, be a, a good reason to, to have an objection to evidence. Oh, and then hearsay, we already discussed that. We need to corroborate evidence. Okay, so after you've done all of, you've, you've sent off your um, your notice, you've gotten them present, they have had an opportunity to go through the entire proceeding, now you guys have listened to all of the evidence that's pre been presented, and you've had a completely built up record, and you have um, asked all the questions you have, it's time to deliberate, and you guys need to make a decision. As we discussed earlier, sometimes you can deliver in closed session. We will give you that on a case-by-case -case basis. We'll let you know when it's allowable. But your decision is always made in open session. It has to be done by a motion and a second, and you have to do your roll call vote, meaning everybody's vote has to be uh, <coughs> identifiable. And then you have to state your findings of fact and conclusions of law, meaning you can't just say, we have decided that um, there's probable cause to believe that a uh, gift was received. You have to actually explain. We determined that there was a car that was received. There was no consideration paid for it. They, um, you know, all those those the, those different things that will have come out during the hearing. You'll actually put those on the record as part of your decision, and then just as and then state what your conclusions are based on that. That's how you get to your uh, decision. That's not arbitrary or unreasonable. If you have it supported by what you've actually dis you know, been discussing and what's actually come before you, then that's how you make your decision. Will you be helping us put that together? We we can, yes. Okay. So I it just, you know, I mean, I've done these myself, and there, there's sort of a step-by-step -step process to them yes. to, to, get the con to get to your conclusion. And so there's two practices that when it comes to your findings of fact and conclusions of law. The first is to actually issue a written decision. And there's never a problem with that. Um, it's usually recommended. However, because of timing a lot of times, it's easier to just go ahead and issue a verbal decision at the hearing, and then your, your written decision is considered your, your meeting minutes. And that is really helpful when um, you have a, a situation where you need things to keep moving forward and you don't meet regularly enough for things to, to keep going. And so it's great that the court's looking at it that way. If you, if you would prefer instead to issue written findings of fact and conclusions of law, we can certainly adopt that practice, which is a, a great practice to adopt. So it's just entirely up to you guys how you want to do it. If everything's being, I mean, they, they bring that thing about the gift forward to us, the complaint, we listen to both sides, discussions, questions. We're going to be deciding really that night or that day or whatever. I mean, yeah, unless this thing winter is a long, drawn out thing, it's going to be done that day so we really want to have time to lay out any kind of decision would we or do we 
take a break and have someone write it out and then bring it back? And no, what would happen is it, how it usually happens, this is what I, I see in the past, is you would issue your verbal decision, then direct staff to prepare the written findings of fact and conclusions of law. They bring them to you at the next meeting and you sign off on them. But that's usually when you are meeting frequently enough for that to happen or you call a special meeting well, to make it happen. And this body only meets when there's a complaint. So uh, if we were to have a, a hearing on, say, Monday, and we issue our verbal um, decision, and then we want something written, we could write that night, say, let's meet again. You know, when, when would it be ready? It's ready on Wednesday. Let's meet again on Wednesday, and we'll do it then. I mean, is that how we would do it? I mean, once you issue that verbal decision, it's out there. Yes. So, I mean, if it, I mean, is there any purpose in waiting a month, or are we better off trying to get it together as quickly as possible? And it'll take five minutes, really, I think, on the second one, right? So, yeah, I mean, sometimes the findings of fact and conclusions law can be a little convoluted. It just kind of depends on how complex it is. And so that's probably what's going to dictate it. If you've got something really, really um, odd, it's kind of just a, an abstract idea that you're trying to, you know, really, and you guys have struggled with it, and reaching a decision was kind of difficult, that's probably when you would want to actually do written findings of fact. If it's very simple, you know, straightforward, um, yes or no, you know, there was everything just kind of went in that direction, it's a little bit easier to just have that, that okay. uh, written, or that uh, verbal decision. And use your minutes. Okay, so with that, we are wrapping up. Um, just to summarize, the procedural due process requires written notice to parties, opportunity to be heard, and decision that is not arbitrary and reasonable. It applies any time you're affecting an individual, and the whole purpose is to satisfy those fundamental principles of, of fair play and justice. Do you guys have any other questions? Um, can you email us a copy of your... Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, you guys want sure. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. That would be that would be helpful just so we have something to review and study. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, I guess going forward, once everyone uh, on the committee is up to speed here, then do we establish a date for it? You know, if we have a complaint to establish a date, well, how does that get done? As far as um, for coming up with the date for the hearing? Yes. So once, I know that you guys have an outstanding complaint currently, you have 45 days to actually hear it. We wanted to make sure that you guys had an opportunity to be trained before you were thrown right. into the gauntlet. <laughs> and so now it's just an issue of, of scheduling a time that works for everybody, which I know that staff is going to be doing now that we've got this one done. So staff schedules it by conferring with the different members and so it works out? Yes. Okay. And then at what time do we... Uh, we have to recuse ourselves or anything else like that. What is that done before that meeting is scheduled or at the time the meeting is scheduled? Or It can happen uh, even during the, the proceedings. So if at any point you realize that there's a problem, you're biased, or you've already prejudged it, or you, you know, you're just, you're not capable of giving the fair and impartial, right. at any time in the proceedings you can say, you know what, I'm sorry, but I need to recuse myself and you should step away from, from the table. Does it have to be public record? Then? That, why, you know, I mean like, Say, say you, uh, you were filing a complaint against my next door neighbor who I'm super good friends with and all that kind of stuff. So do I have to tell you, you know, as soon as a complaint is filed, can I just say, I'm recusing myself, there's no way I can make an unbiased decision, or do I have to wait till the start of the hearing to say, I'm recusing myself for this reason? I think that the, the best practice would be is if you know that there's something that you are going to have to recuse yourself for. You would want it to do. You would want to do it before the meeting. This way, if we need to get an alternate in, okay. in we have an opportunity to do that. Yep. All right. Okay. Anybody else have any other questions? Very good. Thank you, Attorney Chavez. And uh, I think uh, next uh, agenda item, uh, unless you unless you have anything more for us on this. No. Okay. We do not. Next agenda item is a staff report. We actually just covered everything as far as okay. Yeah. <laughs> that was easy. Don't see a jury. I just I, keep I, going. I make it a motion to adjourn. Unless anybody else has anything further, there's a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. We have a second. Uh, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Carries.
Thank you all very much.